We're all familiar with common images of evil. Serial killers, supernatural monsters, acts of terror. But what about the general evil that pervades daily life? Distant wars, factory farming, sweatshops. Evil is not solely characterized by hideous maliciousness and twisted pathology. Instead, more often than not, it appears in the banal and acceptable cycle of the everyday. Where does this evil come from? The existential anthropologist Ernest Becker posited that humans experience the unique situation of being finite creatures aware of their own finitude. We get up, live our lives, try our best, knowing that this will all eventually end. From this, we experience a sort of existential guilt, which results from the self-conscious bafflement at having emerged from nature, at sticking out too much without knowing what for, at not being able to securely place himself in an eternal meaning system. To defend against this, to deny our deaths, we have developed belief structures that will guarantee our symbolic existence long after our biological lives have ended. These beliefs act to atone for this guilt. Within them, we have a blueprint to become a hero in some sense, to offer something of ourselves. From ancient rituals to industrial society, all of human social behavior, according to Becker, is a hero system that promises victory over death. Unfortunately, these hero systems are frequently challenged. Anomalies exist to remind us that what we believe in, what guarantees our own symbolic immortality, is far from guaranteed. And if proven wrong, we die. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. I'm a huge proponent of lifelong learning. Whether I was in school or out of it, I've always valued learning new topics, no matter the field. However, one area that always scared me was math and science. That is until I found Brilliant, a fun and interactive way to learn topics that I usually would find to be way too complex. Brilliant offers hands-on lessons in math, science, and computer science, allowing you to learn six times more effectively than watching lecture videos, thanks to its interactive approach. I found Brilliant's course on computer science fundamentals to be very helpful in understanding algorithms, something that impacts anyone with a computer. The course goes over the fundamentals such as decision trees and parallelism. I think this info is especially useful in understanding how computers make those important behind-the-scenes decisions. If your curiosity goes beyond this, Brilliant has over 60 other courses with clear and intuitive explanations that can tell you how STEM actually works and how it's relevant in your everyday life. No matter what your level of knowledge, the step-by-step -step solutions and fun problem-solving exercises ensure that you'll be able to master all sorts of technical subjects. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash sisyphus55 or click on the link in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Each person nourishes his immortality in the ideology of self-perpetuation, to which he gives his allegiance. This gives his life the only abiding significance it can have. No wonder men go into rage over fine points of belief. If your adversary wins the argument about truth, you die. And so most ideologies locate evil in those beliefs that contradict their own, identifying the threat of life in some place where it can be placated, controlled, and destroyed. From this, Becker views all of human history as a succession of immortality ideologies, the battle of good versus evil, in which each side thinks that the other is a threat to their own self-perpetuation. All ideology is about one's qualification for eternity, and so all disputes and conflicts are about who is truly dirty. The use of the term dirty here is important. All that is evil, culturally speaking, is that which reminds us of our bind to the earth, to our wretched condition as animals destined for worm food. Across many belief systems, the devil represents the body and those gross things that remind us of our earthly condition. Similarly, the enemy usually functions as the scapegoat, the devil or evil incarnated. Their existence reminds us of our own potential for filth. 
As Otto Rank notes, this leads to an impulse for destruction. The death fear of the ego is lessened by the killing, the sacrifice of the other. Through the death of the other, one buys oneself free from the penalty of dying, of being killed. War determines fate. It tests to see which side the gods are on by who has killed more in the end. This is actually a well-studied phenomenon in social psychology, the cycle of dehumanization. When one group perceives the other as less than human, as representative of our closeness to death, they dehumanize that group. The other group, when dehumanized, in turn dehumanizes the group dehumanizing them. This cycle perpetuates and builds and is hypothesized to be the driving force behind everything from racial prejudice to mass wars. Interestingly then, Becker does not locate evil in death itself or any threats of life. Rather, he argues that evil is grounded in this scapegoating, this use of the other to assert one's heroism. Evil is wherever we use our fear of death to justify acts of violence and hatred towards others. As he notes, evil is caused by man's hunger for perpetuation, and this appetite is driven, above all, by our vulnerability and guilt. We are pathetic and fragile creatures who must appropriate others to perpetuate ourselves. Evil is born from fear. Whether this is in terms of destroying the other to affirm our own self-importance and ideological righteousness, or through dehumanizing others and thereby justifying their exploitation to serve our biological and symbolic continuation. The latter form of appropriating others out of fear reflects one of the most prevalent forms of death denial, capitalism. Money is an effective immortality symbol. According to Norman Brown, this means that economic activity, rather than being rational and secular, is sacred at heart. We create surplus, we make useless goods, we suffer for profit at a point where it is beyond actually meeting our material needs. As Becker would argue, many of us strive for wealth and generate a surplus in order to offer something, to stand out. We will become heroes. We will no longer feel the guilt of existing. Capitalism is yet another immortality ritual, evident in the words of Mary Douglas. Money provides a fixed, eternal, recognizable sign for what would be confused, contradictable operations. Ritual makes visible external signs of internal states. Money is only an extreme and specialized type of ritual. At times we may remember that we can't carry the money we made to our graves. In the end, we only have fleeting moments of felt immortality and the urge to always make more. We become alienated. Something happened in history which gradually despoiled the average man, transformed him from an active, creative being into the pathetic consumer who smiles proudly from our billboards that his armpits are odor-free around the clock. This sort of alienation effectively distances us from evil. We feel cozy in the system, and we are only ever momentarily bothered by the evils that stem from profit. Environmental destruction, private prisons, political corruption, the industrial war complex. Where pathological ideologies may clearly define the lines between good and evil, the modern machine of capital has simply standardized appropriation. Still, it comes from the same place, an inherent denial of death itself. To defeat evil, the sort of evil that stems from fear, Becker posits that we must go beyond a historical view of human nature. As he argues, conservatives and thinkers such as Freud view humans as inherently selfish and destructive. On the other hand, certain schools of Marxism and Rousseau view humans as a blank slate, corrupted by evil institutions that, if altered, will result in the end of evil. Becker believes that humans are neither inherently evil nor neutral, but instead they are fearful and weak. From this sphere, we have developed society, which is a standardized system of death denial. He points at a proclivity for us to naturally establish systems of unfreedom, arguing that men fashion unfreedom as a bribe for self-perpetuation. We do this, of course, because we need something to guarantee our importance. Humbly, Becker proposes a world scientific body of diverse expertise that works on an agreed general theory of human unhappiness. In it, they would see societies as hero systems where people ironically turn the world into an even larger graveyard by trying to bring forth absolute purity and goodness. 
Specifically, he argues for a Marxism that emphasizes the psychological and spiritual dimensions of human nature. We must view ourselves, and everyone, first and foremost, as terrified and vulnerable. Billionaires, then, rather than saints of progress or malicious devils, become paragons of humanity at its most terrified. To amass such wealth, to appropriate others to such an extent, hints at an underlying symptom of horror at the thought of one's death. The criminal, the murderer, they too can be viewed as acting out of weakness and pathetic humanity. Warmongering nations are then viewed as societies whose sense of symbolic immortality is threatened. Above all, such an organization will center on one key idea. It is the evil who are most fearful. Beyond this, Becker does not attempt to paint any sort of visions of utopia. In other work, he has hinted at a sort of Kierkegaardian leap of faith, as well as creativity through art as individual solutions to coping with our own mortality. And perhaps the problem of evil will always be there in some form. However, I do think that this shift in perspective is fruitful and should be applied. I think this idea of fear being behind evil should only further encourage us to view love as the only true savior, no matter how hokey and cliche such an answer sounds. To love courageously, in spite of the terror, in spite of fear, and in spite of death, to appreciate rather than appropriate, to choose love over fear. Love has never been a popular movement, and no one's ever wanted really to be free. The world is held together, really it is held together, by the love and the passion of very few people. Otherwise, of course you can despair, walk down the street of any city, any afternoon, and look around you. What you've got to remember is what you're looking at is also you. Everyone you're looking at is also you. You could be that person. You could be that monster. You could be that cop. And you have to decide on yourself not to be.